Good morning, Calvary. Good morning. I think this week, uh, any chance you get, you need to give Craig a virtual fist bump. Whether that's a tweet or a text, you should just virtually fist bump him because I thought that was hilarious, part of the announcement video, and I just thought I'd throw that out there as we start. We're talking today about the elephant has left the room, and so we're talking today about healing, not the kind of healing that happens when someone says, you know, like, um, I was blind and now I see, but I'm talking about healing of the heart. Do we recognize that a lot of times that, that when we walk around the churches, our churches are full of people who are wounded, who have been wounded by people like you and I. There, the natural tendency of the church is to look around and, and, and see a bunch of people who are wounded. And, and here's what we think a lot of times. We think, if everybody would just treat me right, if everybody would just, what does it look like if we really allow God to heal our hearts and embrace what God wants us to be as a people of healing? And, and is that even possible? I remember growing up, and this is a, a little story of why this might be necessary. I remember growing up, I was a minister, uh, minister's son. My dad was a minister of music. And I remember, I've shared this once or twice before, I, I remember in the halls of my church, there was a, uh, a lady uh, who had a son. And the son, I don't even remember who the lady and who the son was, but I remember the story and I remember the event. And the son challenged me to a race through the halls. And I was like, yeah, it's on, right? I was probably like four or five. I mean, this is one of my first memories. And I was like, I'm totally doing this. And at the end of the race that the other boy challenged me to, the mother of the other boy comes over and scolds us, says, you don't run in the church. And I don't remember exactly what she said. And she probably didn't say it as dramatically as I remember as a child. But I remember her going to my mom and saying something to the effect of, how could you let your son run in the church? You, he is a minister's son. Shouldn't he know better? And in that moment, I remember thinking, I caused my mom pain. And I don't think that lady meant anything. I think she was trying to honor God. I think she was trying to, to show. But sometimes people hurt you in life and they don't mean to. And sometimes they just mean to. And how do we deal with this? Because whether or not you grew up in a minister's family or are a minister, or whether or not you have encountered people in your life, people will hurt you. Truth number one for the day. You will be hurt by people. So what do we do with these wounds? How do we live with them? How do we go on? I don't think God wants you to be wounded and live life wounded I think he wants you to live a life that has been healed in the restoration of Jesus. We're going to be looking in 1 Peter chapter 2 today, 1 Peter chapter 1 first, 1 Peter chapter 1. But before we get there, and as we set this up, I just want to talk, when people feel, talk about uh, healing, the first thing that comes to mind, in other words, someone's wounded you, the first thing that comes to most people's mind is the word forgiveness. We're going to cover forgiveness in about 30 seconds here. And, and I'm actually going to give you three passages that you can look up later that we're not even going to read. Three passages, if you want to write these down, I'm giving you a chance to get your pen out and ready, that you can read. And it's Matthew 6, 14, Colossians 3, 13, and Ephesians 4, 32. I'll read those again. Matthew 6, 14, Colossians 3, 13, and Ephesians 4, 32. And basically what this passage is, those three passages talk about is this idea of you should forgive other people because God has forgiven you. In other words, you have wronged many people, including God himself. So you should forgive others because if everybody in this world got what they deserved, we would all get hell. Not to be dramatic, it's just a reality. And so if you really understand that God loved you in your mess, that God has forgiven you despite what you've done to him, despite how you've damaged your relationship with him, and you really come to this place where you want to be restored in your relationship with God, then one of the things you have to do is you have to be able to forgive others. So if we go around and we forgive others, then we're healed, right? Here, what do you do when you forgive someone and people continue to hurt you? There's the passage in the Bible that says, Lord, how many times should I forgive you? And it says 70 times 7. So we start keeping tally. 1 through 490, right? Uh, 472. I can't wait for this to be over, right? And so we sit there going, oh, I'm ready. I'm ready to be healed from this and, and not have to forgive you anymore. I'm counting, right? We could probably get there with our spouses, let's be honest. We could probably do that. But I don't think that's the point of the passage. 
I think the point of the passage is you forgive people because God has forgiven you and you, you keep this. But what happens when you forgive, but it still hurts? You realize that some, just because you forgive someone doesn't mean the pain goes away. That you can actually forgive someone and still be wounded. And what, it, what ends up happening a lot of times is we forgive people and we want to trust them again, but we've learned through the course of life that to forgive people and to allow them back into our life ultimately means they will wound us again. And so the temptation that, that goes throughout this time is after we forgive, after we forgive, after we forgive, we come to a place where our tendency is, I'm done with you. I can't handle the pain anymore. And, and so what we end up doing is we either put our fists up and, the, and this is innate and part of us, you are either a fighter or a flighter. That when conflict arises in your life, you're either going to put your dukes up or you're going to run. And we see this happen in the church, right? If something goes wrong in the church you're in, you either put your dukes up or you flight. Now, there's a time and a place to leave a church. Hear me, I get that. But if you're going from church to church to church to church to church to church to church, looking for the perfect church, you're a flighter and you're ignoring the problem. The problem may be you. And if you're a fighter, the person who says, if I could just get this church to go like I want it to go, the problem may be you. And the reality of it is, I'm going to disappoint you, and you can fight or you can fight against me. And I, this church will ultimately disappoint you, and the people in this church will ultimately disappoint you. The people in your marriage, if you're married, will ultimately disappoint you. Your mom and your dad will disappoint you. Your kids will disappoint you. Let's all go eat lunch. That's cheery. <laughs> so what do we do? Do we walk around with all these open wounds commonly, con, um, constantly exposed and just saying, I'm just wounded? You ever known that person? I'm just wounded. I'm just wounded. I'm just wounded. You fall off the cliff. You know, it's like, we get it. You're wounded. But does God want you to live that way? When I see the fruits of the Spirit, peace, love, joy, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and all those things, you know, you sing the song. I have to sing the song to get it right. But uh, when, you, when you find all those characteristics and we look at God's people, are we reflective of this or are we walking wounded, constantly burned and beat up by the people who are supposed to love us? So if forgiveness doesn't lead to healing, but we are supposed to be healed. How are we healed? In other words, how do we live life as God intended us to live it? Whole. I want us to read in 1 Peter chapter 2, no, chapter 1, I keep saying that, 1 Peter chapter 1, and before we even read this, I want you to understand the context. It, he's writing to a group of people in early Rome that are about to be persecuted by a man named Nero. You and I are probably not going to be persecuted, for sure at not the level that Nero did. Nero was a mean man. One of the things he did in life was as Rome burned, and a big part of Rome burned, and he had to blame someone, so he blamed this group of new believers called Christians that people tend to not like anyways. And so what he did with them is he would tie them up on stakes and burn them as lamps at night. That's persecution. And so why does this passage apply to us in healing? Because it really does, because basically Peter's saying, people will hurt you, but don't be defined by that hurt. So translate this and back off the idea that you're probably not being persecuted, although there is persecution going in the world today. Over in the Middle East, there's a group of people, ISIS has taken over, and they're walking around and they're branding the houses with a, a Hebrew word, a Hebrew letter for N, which stands for Nazarene or follower of Christ. You don't label a house like that unless you intend to do something. So pray for them. Pray for the believers over there. But in our sense, in our, our idea, we're reading this passage through the lens of as people hurt us, how are we to respond? 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 12. I've actually read these verses before, but it really sets us up for where we're really going, which is 13 through 16. 1 Peter 1, 3. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, uncorrupted, and unfading, kept in heaven for you 
For you are being protected by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this, though now for a short time you have had to struggle in various trials so that the genuineness of your faith, more valuable than gold, which perishes though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You love him, though you have not seen him. And though not seeing him now, you believe in him and rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that would come to you searched and carefully investigated. They inquired into what time or circumstances the spirit of Christ within them was indicating when he testified in advance to the messianic sufferings and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. These things have now been announced to you through through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Angels desire to look into these things. And let me start with the end of that passage first, and we're going to work our way back up a little bit. Angels should look into these things. What? The fact that you and I are able to hear of the power of the love of Jesus. Do you know how we are able to live and hear of Jesus and live in his love? Because someone has gone before us and through their trials and through their persecution, they have sought God and lived faithfully, thus passing it on from generation to generation to generation to where you and I are afforded to sit in our comfortable air-conditioned chair and hear of the power of Christ. Glory to God. And what we're receiving, as you back that up, is the salvation of our souls. And the salvation of our souls, the natural tendency is to look at, okay, I know that this life is hard, and one day I will not suffer. And there is truth there. One day, when we are no longer on this earth, we will encounter Jesus. And when we encounter Jesus, guess what? There will be no more cancer. There will be no more gossip. There will be no more lies. There will be no more hardships because the relationship will be fully restored. But salvation doesn't have to wait for eternity. While we look at the time where there will be no more heartache and no more pain, he backs this up and he he leads us to the opening salvo, the opening shot across the bow where he says, well, you know, when you're looking for the crux of a passage, where do you look? The beginning, right? Let's lead and see where he leads us in the beginning, verse 3. Praise the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, for he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. A living hope. Not a hope that is to come, but a living hope that is alive now. A living hope that comes through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, this living hope means that salvation is here now. This living hope that means God is tangible now. This living hope is Jesus. You see, he's not in the tomb anymore. He is alive, and because he is alive, he is not up in heaven looking down at us right now. In fact, he is in this very room, in this presence, in this space, dwelling with us. He is tangible, knowable. We can sense his presence. Though we may not see him with our eyes, he is here. Salvation is here. And when we have this living hope, then then God is with us, then we can't go around living our life in the misery and acting like life is at its end. We have hope because he is alive. He died so that you might be able to walk with him and know him. And this living birth, what does it say there? Is giving birth. You are giving birth into a living hope. I love that idea. Giving birth into a living hope. What does giving birth mean? I remember holding my oldest son. I'm not going to try and embarrass you. But I remember holding holding my oldest son when he was first born. There's something that happens right then and there. And and I know that people have different ideas uh, with babies and stuff. But when I was holding my son in that moment, I didn't sit there and think, this is going to be hard. I probably should have, but I didn't. (laughs) 
I didn't sit there and think, oh, one night he's going to have 103.6 temperature and I'm going to want to call 911 and my wife's going to have to talk me down. I didn't sit there and think, I, I, I didn't see the problems. I saw hope. Because birth is life. And this giving birth is the idea that God is still in the creating business. And how often do we live our lives not recognizing that God is still in the business of creating a hope in us? He's still in the business of creating opportunity. Uh, He's still in the business of changing our lives and hearts. Do you live in the living hope that any problem you have could go away? That any problem, God has defeated death. He is alive. He is knowable. And so we cling to this idea that God is creating something new in me and in you. This living hope, it's birthed in us. That means we believe that better days are ahead, if not on this earth, then in an eternity. But, but we cling to the idea that no matter what comes our way, God is making us new. And in making us new, we find hope in him. The revelation, the revealing of Jesus himself in us. So what does this have to do with healing? Everything. Because you see, as God becomes alive in you, you begin to see the world through his eyes. Look with me in verse 13 of chapter 1. Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be serious and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, Do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance, but as the one who called you is holy, so you are also to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Say, Daniel, I'm still not tracking. How is this holiness? I mean, how is this leading us to healing? How? Well, it begins there with setting your minds. This living hope allows you to set your minds on him. You know what I love about setting your minds? It's your choice. You can set your minds on the things of God or you can set your minds on the wounds. You can set your minds on the character and the nature of God or you can set your mind on the way the world disappoints you and how your spouse disappoints you, how your kids or your parents disappoint you, how your best friends disappoint you, how your church disappoints you. You can do that or you can set your mind on Christ. I love the saying that says, bitterness is the poison that is swallowed by you. Bitterness is when you allow an open wound in your life where someone has stabbed you to breed and uh, infect you with disease. Bitterness is the root of what comes when you allow these wounds to fester in your heart. And bitterness is caused not by the one who wounded you, but by you. When you allow these things, when you allow what the words of other people to penetrate your heart and to find you, basically what you're saying is, I am not leaning into the hope of God, but I am leaning to the sin and the the, the corruption of the world that God has come to defeat, and I'm letting that define me. Or you can be defined by God. When you set your mind, you choose to focus. You're looking forward, not backwards. You're setting your mind on the hope of what is to come because hope is always coming. Hope is always leading us through. And you're coming to the place where you understand the revelation of Christ as he is revealed in you. Through the revelation of Christ that is to come and and as God is revealed to you on this earth. Now, you will not fully arrive. We've already, I'm going to say that enough this morning. You will not walk out of here necessarily feeling, woo, I'm great from here on out. Woo. But as the healing process takes place and as you walk closer to God, you see the world different by setting your minds to where he goes to verse 14. Now, he cautions them, do not be conformed by your desires. 
Your desires are for justice. Your desires are to to go around and your former ignorance, what it says there, your former ignorance, your former desires were, you wronged me, now fight or I'm flighting. And God says, it's not the answer. Fighting and flighting is not the answer. It's me. I am the answer. Put your dukes down. Stop running and seek me. Your former ways, they're, they're, they're bad. Your former ways are just wrong. And, and yes, you may be wounded in the future, but I am there to sustain you. I will be your protector, your shield. And no matter what anybody throws your way, I will be with you. That promise is what affords me to be a pastor, right? It's what affords me to be with God's people. That God will be with So you set your minds not being conformed to the way the world operates. But finally, we come to verse 15. And this is seemingly an odd verse when you're talking about healing your heart, but it makes total sense. But as the one who has called you is holy, you also are to be holy in your conduct. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Holiness. Fancy preacher word, my mic keeps falling off. Fancy fancy preacher word, sanctification. This idea of being sanctified, being made right, being holy as God is holy. Why does he want me to do that? Does he want to rob me of fun? No, he wants you to be like him because he wants you to see the world like he sees it. And as you're drawn to him and you become more like his character and and like his nature, you're no longer mad at the people because the people around you are made in the image of God and God loves them as well. And you can't be bitter and angry at people that God loves. As you're drawn into the nature of God, you're able to put things down. You're, You're able to walk away and you're able to see the world broken in desperate need of the God who is alive, desperately in need of the living hope. And you're no longer on the defense or on the attack. You're just in the era of love. I want you to know what God has given me. The ability to love you when I couldn't do it on my own. And is it possible, I think it is, that the ultimate healing doesn't come from anything apart but sanctification? Drawing near to God. So here's the question. Do you want to be bitter? Do you want to be mad at the world around you? Do you want to be pessimistic, negative, miserable, which will make the people around you pessimistic, negative, and miserable? Or do you want to be a glimmer of hope, reflecting the hope of the world? Say, Daniel, it's so hard because people have wronged me in so many ways. I get it. But see, you've probably wronged some people yourself. But there's one who didn't. And Peter challenges us. Don't be mad at the government because the government's full of people who mess up. And he's talking about Nero. and We just talk about the United States sometimes, right? Don't be mad at your bosses. Don't be mad at your spouse. And the rest of the book of 1 Peter is really about this idea of drawing near to God so that you can let go of the pain and the hardship that the world has. But I have a right. So did Jesus. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, we see Peter's response to this. For you were called to this. Verse 21. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. We are followers making followers, ultimately following Jesus, right? So follow in his steps. He did not commit sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. In other words, if there was anybody who deserved to be able to stand up and go, stop hurting me, it was this man because he had done no wrong. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. And when he was suffering, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. 
He bore our sins in his body on a tree. So having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. For you have been healed by his wounds. You were like sheep going astray, but you now have returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. You have been healed by his wounds. You see, if sanctification leads to healing and sanctification is the ultimate drawing near to God, then the opposite of that is walking away from him. You and I have done that and it wounded him and ultimately leads to our own demise. What would this look like if we really were healed today? In other words, we stopped putting up our fists. We stopped running away. And we came before God and we said, God, we set our minds on you. Make us like you. And tomorrow I want to be more like you. And tomorrow I want to be more like you. And tomorrow I want to be more like you. And I'm going to cling in the hope that that is coming, that no matter what comes my way, tomorrow will be better because I will be drawn closer to you. Through loss of job, I will be drawn closer to you. Through cancer, I will be drawn closer to you. Through persecutions and trials and people attacking me, I will be drawn closer to you. So tomorrow, whatever may come my way, whatever the world throws my way will be better because I will be walking closer to you. Healing found here. I don't know where you are in your struggle, but if you've never had a relationship with Jesus, you're probably not going to find healing because he is healing. And the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, in other words, he came and died for you and repent, then you can be saved. He died on the cross. His wounds were for your wounds so that you might be restored to him. If you've never done that before, I, I challenge you to give your life to him. Write on your connect card and let us contact with you because it's more than just checking a box. We need to talk you through some things. Let's tell you what it means to be a follower of Christ. To those in the room who claim to be followers of Christ, I'm glad you are. Do, do you reflect that? We all fail at some levels. You can ask my family. I'm not perfect. My life is not all together. But I know this. I want to be drawn closer to him every day. And as I'm drawn closer to him every day, then whatever the world throws my way will dissipate in the light of who he is. You don't have to walk around like a person who deserves to be in a mass unit. God heals all. And though the trials will still come, you will be refined by the fire as you are drawn into his nature and his character. And here, salvation begins. Close with a story. Yesterday I was, had the privilege of being at a wedding in Lexington. Two of my former students when I was a college minister were getting married. One of them I've gone through a lot with. Um, not to get into it, but he's the, the kid who would show up at my house at two in the morning and want to talk. Uh, he survived an awful crash. He made some bad choices following the crash because he was angry at God. And I don't know why I didn't share this in the first two services, but I just want to ask you this. Maybe your anger is directed at God. What I would encourage you is God is not angry at you. Sin has entered in the world, and as a result, life hurts. But God loves Maybe you need to stop running from God or fighting God and embrace him as this young man did yesterday. As I watched him marry his new bride, the first thing after did is he broke the bread with her and then he got down on his knees in something I've never seen in a wedding ceremony and washed his wife's feet because Jesus did that for him. God came to love you Will you let him? God, we thank you for what you're doing here. May we forgive as you've forgiven us, but God, more than that, would you heal us? 
as you are our living hope, would you heal us? And we know there will be people who are hurt us, some in this very room, but God, we pray that we are drawn closer to you. We pray that we don't fight or flight, but we just show your love. That when the world says, you should act this way, why are you not? We can say, we can't do this on our own, but it's because we've encountered Jesus and we cannot be the same. Restore us as we're drawn closer to you. And whatever comes our way, when we fail, pick us back up and draw us closer to you. To follow you and help others to follow you closer. In your name we pray.